I want to talk about some of the things that I see as top priority that that you should look at and consider before you buy a piece of property. And this is going to be a little bit high elevation because there's so much to look at. But this is kind of the short list of things that I go through when I'm buying property. Now, you know, for work and doing construction, doing development, um, I may be looking at things a little bit different and I, I might, the decisions that I make might be different, but the things that I'm looking at are the same. And so here is a bit of a short list of things that I look at when I'm going to be buying property. And I think it's a good list that you could use as you're looking at property. So the first one is location. Now, I put location and most people would scratch their heads and say, why location? Well, location is gonna play a massive part in logistics in your life there on that property. Um, our first piece of property in Eastern Idaho was over in Island Park. You can go back on the channel and look at some of those videos. Um, we were so, <laughs> so precocious and full of wonderment and just getting out of the city and living the life. And it was a great, great location. Except for with our family and the size of our family, we were driving two hours to Idaho Falls down off the hill to the south to get groceries. Now, there were certainly maybe smaller grocery stores closer, but but the groceries in those grocery stores, because they were a little bit more remote, it was a lot more expensive for us to feed our family. And so we would go to the big box stores in Idaho Falls. Or from Island Park, we would go north over to Bozeman and hit Costco. And it was a two hour trip over. A lot of times we'd go over on a Friday evening, spend the night, get up, do our shopping at Costco because that would take a couple of hours and then come home. So it was it was six hour round trip, uh, usually turned into a whole day in order to get groceries. Most people live a life of, hey, I'm gonna pop into Walmart or the local grocery store and grab uh, something and take it home. That just wasn't the case. It was having to plan and then having to travel. And the travel was really the difficult part. So. That applies to, to groceries, as I say, but it also is going to apply to ordering materials for building your house or having uh, a fuel truck come out and fill up your 100 gallon fuel tank that takes care of your equipment on your property, whatever that might be. There's going to be a lot of additional costs in that location of the property. Um, so something to think about is how far do we want to drive and what are the roads like in that drive? I, I joke that it's, it's always how far from Home Depot to the property because I can, can just about add cost, figure out the cost per square foot for every additional 50 miles that it is from Home Depot to build that house. There's going to be a lot of additional cost. And if you think, hey, there's a local lumber store, um, you're still paying for a truck to haul stuff to that local lumber store. You're going to pay more for your two by fours there than you would at Home Depot. And typically a lot of that is going to be the, the freight, the cost of getting it there. So that low, that distance that it has to travel. So next one I want to look at is pulling up. It's the County or, and I say County, maybe you're, in a small city, I, it, you know, it's in these rural communities. Sometimes the cities are really big, even though the city itself isn't very big. So whether you're in the city or the county, whatever it might be, whatever the municipality is, you need to get in and look at what they require for building permits or building location permits. Like Bonner County here in North Idaho, we don't have um, a building department per se. Um, what it is is we'll check to make sure that you're putting that that building that structure um, in the right location, wherever that location might be. 
So the county will check your location of the building, make sure that it's got the right setbacks from the property line, make sure you're not on top of a, an easement or right away or a utility or whatever, and, and make sure that you have some of the other things like uh, addressing and some of those other things that are required for, for a new home site location to be put into the county or the city, whatever it might be, wherever you're at. So you're gonna to wanna to check in with those guys and see what's required and what's the process and how long does the timeline take. Um, so getting into the county and, and or city, whatever that is, and dig into whatever information they might have because they, they may have a lot of information that maybe you hadn't even considered and might even be something I don't have here on the list. Um, next thing is while you're at the county or the city checking into the zoning and zoning is going to be huge because you're going to want to know you might be buying 100 acres or 20 acres or 50 acres but just because you're buying a large parcel doesn't mean that it's possibly like in a in a uh, R5 zone which means that it could break down into five acre parcels now I say R5 because locally here in Bonner County, that's one of their designations is R5, but they might be slightly different. If you're looking at property in Montana or you're out looking at stuff in Texas, the local jurisdiction is gonna break down their zoning stuff however they decided to do that. It's There's all sorts of stuff. It can be, you know, I, I've seen them where it's an I for industrial, it's a seek for commercial, um, it, so it's C1, C5, C10, um, which means it's a commercial designation and this is the size of the parcel. So they may not always be like that, but you want to know what the zoning is on your property. And you want to know that maybe even if your zoning is say uh, Ag Forest 20 and you're buying a 20 acre piece or a 40 acre piece, what if right next door it's R5? That means that some some jerky land developer is going to show up and subdivide that parcel and suddenly you're going to be living next to four houses when you were living next to to, to one house or so something to consider uh, especially if you're putting a bunch of money and you want to be there for the long term looking at the zoning and knowing that um, it, can it break down? What's the likelihood of it breaking down? Um, and you can make a decision. You can say, hey, I'm going to buy property that's further out that's in an ag forest 40. And that way, it's got to be a 40 acre parcel. I'm going to have bigger chunks. I'm going to have more elbow room. There's less likelihood that I'm going to have the neighbors building a house right next door. On the other hand, maybe you want to buy R5. Um, you know, the idea of buying an, an R5, a 40 acre piece in an R5 zone and then breaking it down and selling off a five and another five and maybe you end up with 20 buy a 40 you keep 20 for yourself you sell off four parcels five acres each uh, yeah you end up with with four neighbors but you got to decide where the houses go and you got to make some money um, and so there's some just some different strategies and different ideas, but things to be aware of is the zoning on your property and the surrounding properties. Then I, I want to look at power and utilities. How where are they? And not only where are they, but are they overhead? Are they in the ground? Um, I like power that's been buried in the ground because there's a lot less likelihood that that a tree is going to blow over in a windstorm and knock the power out and you're going to be without power for a day or two or whatever it might be. Even here in, in uh, sunny Sandpoint, we have windstorms and they knock out power all the time. And most of the places have backup generators. So that's the thing you're looking for. Hey, my power is overhead and it's a half mile away. Um, I'm gonna run it underground up my driveway or whatever, but I better have a generator in the garage or I better back up my house when I build it with a backup generator because the likelihood of, of a tree blowing over and knocking out the power is, is probable because the overhead power from, from where it is now back to town is seven miles. That's, that's 
there's a good chance the power at some point is going to get knocked out and you'll be without power and then um, you're going to be on your own to keep those refrigerators um, on so they don't do <laughs> that um, yeah keeping power to the refrigerator so that things don't melt and keeping the house warm or lights on or whatever it might be that's going to be up to you until the power company can restore power again um, just things to consider things to look at uh, obviously water uh, is most likely if in a rural scenario is going to be a well but maybe there is a, a, a local uh, water system or something that somebody put in and you could tie into to the water system or maybe you can tie into the water system and drill a well and you, you build kind of that redundancy of systems kind of like the power I've got power from the city coming in but I've also got a generator it's so I'm backing it up I'm building redundancy in the systems um, but you want to be getting on and looking at the well logs and seeing how deep people are having to drill wells around your property and typically you can get online and look at that information all the well reports uh, I know here in Idaho we have a really great website that shows all the well locations and they're not they're not exact they're approximate but but the depth and the well report is there now there's two things to you can get out of a well report and this is the thing that people are like well it's it's how deep it is well but also you want to look at the gallons per minute because if it's a hundred foot but it's only producing one gallon a minute but the next you know another property you're looking at is 300 foot but it's got 30 gallons a minute um, there's some things to consider there like 30 gallons a minute you can provide for your house you could provide for a garden you could take care of animals there's just tons of water there uh, one gallon a minute you're gonna have to probably put in a tank and then trickle water into the tank and then be able to pull water out of the tank so that you're not overwhelming the well so things to consider there the other is looking at the well report and looking at rock what look at the soils as they drill through that soil you're going to get a good idea of what is in that in the ground around that area and if you're seeing you know black and white granite and and decomposed granite um, that might be something to be concerned about. You may give you an indication that, man, for running utility trenches, we may have to we may have to hammer or blast rock in order to get the power line buried. Um, to put in the footing and foundation, we may have to to drill and blast to put the foundation in. Um, so those there's a lot of good information out there, and most of it is free and easy to access. But it's going to take a little, you know, kind of looking at it, looking at the clues that are, that are there and putting it together in context to your property. Because it's not always crystal clear. You're going to have to, you're going to be guessing a little bit, making some assumptions. But there's good indicators in those well reports and they're worth looking through. And not, not just the one closest to the property, but, but look at six or eight or ten of them around the property. And that will give you kind of an average of what's going on out there. Uh, the next is sewer, and that's going to be probably a, a in, in a rural scenario, it's going to be a uh, septic tank and a leach field. Um, so before you buy that piece of property, get out there with a mini excavator and dig some test holes. Get the health department out there with you, looking at the soil, assessing the soil. Because with that assessment of the soil, they can classify the soil and then with that you'll be able to understand how big of a leach field you're going to have to build for your three bedroom home or your five bedroom home they're going to be different you're going to need more leach field depending on how many bedrooms you're going to have um, and you'll you'll build that capacity based on that soil analysis that you get in the perk test um, so the perk test is you got to have it because you want to know if it's solid clay out there and you might end up with a sand mound or some kind of engineered system that's going to to build your budget and you're not going to have a line item on septic of ten thousand dollars you're going to have a line item of twenty five thousand dollars if you have to do a, an engineered system again all of this is just gathering information to understand if we build our house here if we put a house here if we live here what is it going to realistically take 
to be able to build this house and can we afford it and if we can afford it um, is this does this make sense for the long term because there's there's the cost of building the house but then there's a the cost of living there um, there's maintaining that septic system uh, maintaining the well what if the well pump goes out there's you plowing your own snow again you're an alley cat you live outdoors and um, you're gonna have to look out for yourself you're gonna have to take care of yourself um, nobody's no nobody's going to come along and fix those problems for you without you writing a check um, or fixing it yourself now um, some people would say that they don't want that type of lifestyle. They don't want the hardship and they don't want the, the pain and suffering. Those house cats can, can sit around in a warm, cozy house and wait for the next meal to show up. Um, that's an option. So, um, getting with the sewer per test, if you're going to have the mini excavator out there, do a pothole a bunch of places. Uh, look at places to put a leach field in three or four different places and dig in in the location where you might want to put your house. It wouldn't hurt to, to even dig some four, five, six foot holes wherever you think you might put your house just to investigate if there's rock or sand or what the soil is. Dig a hole, look at it, put the dirt back. Because if you start digging and you hit rock or whatever, you may want to move your house to a different location so you don't have to fight the rock in order to put in the foundation. So while you're out there doing the perk test, you know, look around it. You're not just there to, to perk it, but while you've got that machine on site, look at the soils and get a, get a feel for what you've got. Um, which takes us to the next one. Obviously, soil and rock. While we're out there digging those, we want to look for the, is it clay, is it rock, is it sand? It's going to help us gather information to understand what we've got on site. Now, um, was talking to some folks that called me and they said hey we've got this property and it's got kind of rolling hill and they're the high point but it's a really rocky place and and so man we, we it's got the best views from up there but it's solid rock and I said well wait wait listen yeah the rock is a problem but we might be able to kill two birds with one stone let's go in there and drill and blast that rock we'll use that rock that we've created and we'll build road base our, our sub base for our roads with it and we'll cut off a pad that's nice and flat that's on all on on solid rock and then you can put your house up there and then backfill around that house with with some import material some whatever sand rock dirt gravel that we've got on site but you'll not only get your house where you want it and a house pad built but but the material that we generate there will then build your roads and so will kill two birds with one stone. So you want to look at the soil, you want to understand what you have and what it is and and then how to go about solving the problem. Um, another big one is getting online and looking at the National Wetland Mapper and seeing about the wetlands in your areas. And then that could be something you're back at the county or the city understanding what their requirements for setbacks on wetlands are, what you can and can't do. Um, there's properties out there that are 40, 50 acres and they've got 70, 80% coverage of wetlands because it's got a river that runs through it and there's a lot of like ponds and the, the beavers have dammed it up and it's held the water back and it's really wet and it's, it's beautiful and grassy and there's all sorts of wildlife but there's not going to be a lot of room to put a house. Your options are going to be limited. You want to understand where you can or can't build. Um, based on the wetlands. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers are not going to let you put your house right next to the beaver pond. Uh, they're going to frown on that. So that may limit your choices. So if you show up on the property and you're like, oh look, a beautiful pond and let's put our house right here. You pull up that map and that whole area is wetland. Um, putting your house there is probably not an option. Now, there are some options with the Corps of Engineers on wetlands for things called a 404 permit where if you had a piece of property it was 100 percent wetland you could file a permit and uh, it's called a 404 permit and they would let you fill in a small amount of wetland in order to put your house there so that it's not the end of the world if it's all wetland 
but um, there is a process to go through with that 404 permit. But you want to understand that before you buy it, because um, I've seen people buy property and then find out they can't do what they want with the property, and suddenly they don't want the property at all. So, rather you know that before you buy it, and not have to find out afterwards. Um, access roads and access roads would be um, not only from the county county road, you know, up your driveway, but you may have to you you may have to cross several other properties. You may have um, a an easement over some private property. You may have to cross some state land and then get to your driveway. And you want to understand who owns the access and what your rights are across those. Can you improve the road? Can you put gates up? Um, who's, who maintains those? When do they get maintained? Uh, the other is that distance from, say, back to the county road, back to town. What's that road look like? Is it gravel? Is it pavement? Do they plow it? Where do you sit on the priority list of roads? Because I've seen snowstorms roll in and the, the county is out plowing roads, but they have their priorities based on traffic use. And if you're way out and there's only two or three or four cars that are using that road, you might be the very last person to get your, your county road plowed. So you get a big snowstorm, uh, it might be end of the day or the next day before they get out there and plow it. So you can plow your driveway and, and whatever back to the county road, but it may be a while before the county actually gets out there and plows. So understanding your access roads, and I, when I say access roads, I'm thinking all the way from town all the way to your garage, understanding what it is on whose property and what your rights are for maintenance, improvement, and, and security if, as far as gates and those types of things. So access roads is, is one to really dig into and to understand. Uh, it's not just your property, it's how do we get to your property. Now, topography. Now, um, topography is, is a tough one because we're gonna be learning a lot about the topography through this process. But I think it's really important that we consider topography. Um, if you buy some property and it's got a great big hill on the south side and you want to put your, your, your house right on the north side of that hill, you might be in the shadow of that hill, which means not a lot of sunshine, which means lots more snow, lots more ice, very slow melting. Um, especially if, if it's you're up in Montana and the winters are long, having, being on the, on the sunny side, on the south face and putting your house on the south face and having lots of sunlight, especially on your house and your access roads so that they're going to dry out quicker, the snow is gonna melt quicker. Um, that's something to consider with the topography in relationship to roads and house sites and and then flat spots, do you have, in the topography, are there flat spots where you can put a garden or put a shop or have a pasture for animals or space, whatever it might be. Um, you know, I had, was talking to a guy and he wanted a big enough piece where he could put in a runway. He wanted to put in a 1,700 foot, 1,800 foot runway on his property. And so topography was really, really important of what was the topography not only on his property but the topography on on the parcels around that parcel and then how did the wind move in relationship so that's a little bit extreme but there's a lot of folks that are are backing up building redundancy in their power with a little bit of solar um, or they're doing wind uh, wind generator to help generate power in the winter time when maybe there's not a lot of sunshine but there's certainly more wind generating power with with some kind of a windmill system there's a lot of those out there so understanding the topography and sunlight and then wind is is something really important that you should look at because you pull up a picture on google earth it looks flat the reality is it's not and you need to really 
dig into, find topo maps, understand the, the topography. Google Earth is great. They've got um, the ability to kind of go down and put on the 3D and it'll start kind of show the topography in the land and that helps, that's a good indicator, but getting out on site, walking it and seeing where the shadows are, where the sun is um, and, and how that might play into your home site or your roads, it's something to look at. So, whew, that's a lot to look at, it really is. Um, I mean, it's an overwhelming for me to just talk to you about it and I haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, I've been talking for 25 minutes and I'm just hitting the bullet points. It's going to take time to go through all of these and really gather information. And, and then with that information, see if that parcel or that piece of land really does fit what you want for your rural life. Um, if you've got others that you think are important to check, I would love to hear it. Um, put them down in the comments, uh, send us an email, reach out to us. And in, certainly if you're looking and you would like some help, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're happy to consult. We would, would love to work with you. If we can, if we can help, please let us know.